Hey, what's up, guys? You're listening to the It Takes a Village podcast. I'm Ashley, your host. This is where the struggles are real, the callings are heavy, the kids are sticky. We come together because it takes a village, and this is your tribe. Hey guys, what's up? I'm super excited for you to be listening as always to the It Takes a Village podcast. But before you keep on listening, I just want to disclaimer you that today's episode is adults only. We are going to be talking about the female anatomy. And so if you have a kiddo in the car, now's the time that you would want to hit pause and wait until you do not have a kiddo in the car. Okay, so it's all safe to listen, right? No kiddos are around. You're not on speakerphone. Today's episode is with Dr. Dietza and Dr. Ross from the Women's Therapy Center in New York. You should be familiar with them because they were on, or actually they weren't on, but one of their patients was on the podcast a long time ago, back in episode 24 with Marnie Scott. And Marnie Scott suffered from vaginismus and they helped her overcome that. It was amazing, awesome story. But today I get to talk to those two incredible women who helped Marnie heal and we are talking about intimacy after childbirth hence why I asked you not to have your children present right now um and libido um the changes that we experience in our vaginal health and just our vagina in general after having a baby um and so we're getting into all that nitty-gritty and if you guys remember I had posted a question on Facebook a long time ago if you're in the It Takes a Village podcast group. And some of your questions, actually all of your questions are going to be answered here on the podcast. So without further ado, here is my interview with Dr. Dietza and Dr. Ross from the Women's Therapy Center. Let's get to it. Hey, everybody. I'm super excited to have these two special guests on the podcast today. Um, And you guys have heard about them or about their um, office before um as referred to in episode 24 when we talked with marnie scott on vaginismus and so i'm super excited um to have dr Dietz and dr ross on the podcast today so thank you guys so much for joining me i really appreciate it welcome so before we get started i would love for you guys um before we get into it because we're really going to talk about um some personal things that i feel like a lot of women deal with a lot of women feel Um, but we are just too nervous, too scared, or we feel like um, we're the only ones. We feel abnormal, and so we don't talk about it. Um, Before we get into all that, I would love for you guys to um, tell the audience a little bit about yourselves, um, your professional backgrounds, and what what have you before we get started. All our information, all the information, of course, is on our website, too. So Dr. Ross is a psychotherapist, highly educated, highly trained. Yes, and uh, you want to talk sure. about yourself? Sure. Okay. I'm a uh, psychotherapist, clinical social worker. Uh, okay, and I also have my PhD in clinical sexology. I've worked in the field many, many years now. I don't even want to say how many. <laughs> okay, and <laughs> in all uh, aspects, I do a great deal of work with women who, besides the sexual dysfunctions, but also have postpartum. We're known here on Long Island as the people to go to for women who are having libido and problems after delivery, after mm-hmm. childbirth, when they have children, as well as for all the other sexual dysfunctions we work with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's amazing and what you guys do. <laughs> thank you. Well, you know, we fell into it before I even introduce myself in a way. We fell into it by sheer mistake because when we met over 26 years ago, um, we recognized the need uh, for this type of narrow mm-hmm. field mm-hmm. of fixing that falls between gynecology and psychology or any any of those and sex therapy where you really merge the body and the mind but let me say let, let, let me start from how we could do that uh, uh by um by license i'm a urogynecologic physical therapist and i got my doctorate in clinical sexology so we can touch the body and the mind here with no restrictions mm-hmm. uh so together it opened the door for us to go into what i said before and um and open uh, this specialized service but basically is a medical sexology it's psychosomatic genital disorders anything we make said vaginas happy as long as it goes beyond the scope of um, infection or mm-hmm. basic gynecological care and whatever you get from your gynecologist 
they do whatever you don't get there and still left hanging, which is basically what we are going to end up taking care of. Um, this is where it's at. So unbeknownst to us, there is a huge amount of people of women out there who suffer from a variety of affliction as such, uh, from fear of penetration to, um, to a, a problematic uh, vaginal insertion, to inability to have vaginal insertion, as you had, um, of course, the interview with Marnie before, who was one of our patients for vaginismus, uh, for which we developed a methodology that is known worldwide, uh, to also just sex counseling and just about life. Yeah. Life in the vagina is really what we'd like to uh, offer women because, as you said, there are a lot of questions, but there is a lot of timidness asking them. And the medical field usually poops you or sends you to mm-hmm. Google the good or a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, and so forth it goes. Yeah. Also, life, life in the vagina, the important part about that is that as a woman, we're ever changing. Mm-hmm. So life in the vagina starts when, let's say, you get your first menstrual period and it goes on. It goes on to, you know, as the hormones change, as you have children, then as you get older. So it's very important to remember what Dr. Dietz has said about it's about life in the vagina. Yeah. And that's very true, too. Um, and that makes me think about the fact that, you know, I didn't even think going back to our, starting our menstrual period, but right then and there we go through a change. And then when we decide to have a child, you know, our body changes so much. And then, you know, after you have the child, then it's like another, that's like another phase that you're in when, and then, and so, and I feel like we just feel so much pressure. Um, and we, yes, and we, we, do. and we don't know what's like necessary, like we're not prepared for that part of, I don't feel like as much as during the pregnancy, you're very much guided. You know, you have a gynecologist, you're seeing them, they're telling you what's going on. And then after you have the baby, you're kind of just like left. <laughs> you're left there. Yes. Um, you're exactly right. You're left to fly on your own. Mm-hmm. And then, so that's kind of where I wanted to land with you guys is that right after that, so you're kind of expected just to hop back into life like nothing ever happened. And you're, we're like, whoa, wait a minute. Our things are not the same. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So how do we navigate intimacy? Like we just had a child, um, but a lot of women are nervous. Like I know that the first time back at it, they don't want to because they're, you know, either we've gotten cut, we've gotten, you know, whatever. And we feel like things are different or we're afraid it's going to be different. And then so we just try to prolong the process of intimacy because we don't know what to do with that. Absolutely. And we can prolong it. Because for women, you know, as long as we get affection and we get all the attention we want and the hugs, sexuality can wait. There is no rush to it. So that's part of the female sexual template. It could definitely be put on hold. So women can definitely hold out. But yes, the the pressure is enormous and, and there is always a pressure on women to perform and to come back and to do and to um, be like you were and to know what to do, like an autopilot. And it doesn't quite work like that. It really doesn't. So there is a lot that's happening after you just had a baby. It's not uh, such a simple event. Right. Uh, right. Although the body is built for it, it is a rather traumatic event. Uh, happy traumatic, hopefully, but yeah. traumatic <laughs> nonetheless. And it affects, yeah, and it affects physiologically and biologically and hormonally and emotionally and relationship and sexuality. You, so there is a lot that needs to bounce back and recover before we are smiling and saying, "Okay, it's a hot date. Let's go at it." Mm-hmm. There could be, there is the partner demands and the partner partners adjustments and we can expand on all these points along the conversation here if we want to but there is the the third part you know the, the partners um uh as we said demand and adjustment and readjustment too the baby could come with their own set of demands and adjustments not all babies are easy peasy um so there could be some problems here yeah and the woman should know that and should be allowed to come back Hmm. the proper way. You know, when we uh, are in that place, for us, like you said, it's we can go without. Like we can cope and we can snuggle and we can, you know, and we feel good because we're not ready yet. But for the the men, 
Um, and maybe not all men, but um, I know for me and my marriage, when, when we had our first child, um, that to him was like a rejection. It was like me saying, you're mm-hmm. not you're not what I need or like, and and I could tell him, you know, like, oh, but it's because, you know, I'm tired or like this just all happened. But for them, it's like rejection. And so how do we, how do we navigate that, that part between us to where we can keep the intimacy? Nobody's feeling rejected. Nobody's um, feeling unwanted. And, and how do you fulfill those needs in a, in a marriage so early? Because I feel like that can be a big um, stressor. Like, added to, you know, you just had a baby and things might not be easy. And then, you know, on top of it, you have, you know, your husband who feels rejected and his needs aren't being met. And, you know, and then you have this internal conflict as a woman and as a new mom. It's a huge issue. It's an issue that goes back millennia. Women have always been expected to perform and be at service. And that's one of the sad things. And it translates even to today's world with our education in the Western society here, and still to fulfill his needs. Mm -hmm. You know, intimacy is a choice. It's not a need. We need to breathe, eat, and sleep. Those are needs we'll die without. But being intimate and sexual, it's not a need. That said, the male sexual template feels that it is a need, because without sexual performance, their DNA tells them something is not right. Mm. Also, through sexual, sexual engagement, the males will tend to express their feelings. And if they are being robbed of that, then they feel again, something is not right. I feel rejected, she doesn't like me anymore, the baby is more important than me, or what have you, uh, uh, whatever the excuse is. So how do we navigate that? with a lot of education, with a lot of understanding of what is going on, with all, at the same time with the woman not ducking it for months and months on end because the body was made to restore uh, sexual intimacy once uh, so many weeks, typically six to eight, pass by and everything is restored back to where it could be. Mm-hmm. And you resume activities, sexual activities, but it does take a lot of education. Unfortunately, it's a difficult one because relationships follow different dynamics. Not all relationships have a good communication status. Not all relationships will have an understanding male partner in it. Not all relationships will have the freedom to choose. Some will be bound by religious or cultural codes of performance. So it becomes very complex. Mm. So how would you tell a woman who is who is navigating this part of her life where she just had a baby. Um, it's six weeks out, so it's definitely physically okay. Because um, I feel like it sounds like it's more of um, a head thing for us. Like it's we're in our own heads and we're mm-hmm. and it's like a self-talk thing that's keeping us from moving forward. So what advice would you give to a woman who is in that place? It is to some degree in your head, okay? I would absolutely put a good portion to the head, but I think we also have to rule out postpartum depression. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that even men, after one you know, has a baby, yeah. they go through a change as well in terms of their their depression. Mm-hmm. And I feel like at we overlook that sometimes, mm-hmm. and we have to address that as well, that it could be within both people, okay? And for men, the way to solve that is through intimacy. For a woman, it's stay away from me, like mm-hmm. Dr. Dietz has said. Now, one of the things that I think in terms of res- resolution is really to sit down and talk and not talk in the bedroom. Mm-hmm. Have a discussion about, you know what, l- our lives have really changed. We really have to go back to finding a time for a date night, mm-hmm. making this a priority, even if it means putting it on the calendar and saying, okay, Wednesday night or whatever night, I'm just th- saying, it, we, this is our night. We will find an hour to just be together. And maybe it won't be sexual. Maybe it'll just be to sit and watch a movie together, whatever it'll be to reconnect. And that's the important thing is the reconnection. 
Mm. Because he, he, the the male often feels rejected based on the fact that now you have this new interest that's keeping you 24-7 if you're breastfeeding. They really aren't as involved because breastfeeding mothers are the ones who are taking care of the baby, you know, almost all of the time. Mm-hmm. There is a difference, too, with when a mother is allows the ch- the husband to feed the baby. And I think it's very important that some mo- that mothers pump a bit so that the father can get some of that experience. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because there is something to be said about the father being more involved with the child, which during the years when there was less breastfeeding, you know, and it, every, you know, the children were basically on formula, there were, there was a lot more involvement by fathers by force. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's a, is something that is lacking a bit today. And that even now with the new pumps, there should be some allow the father to participate to understand what you're going through to have to wake up in the middle of the night to do some of that it's very important because many mothers will say oh i wake up all night long and i let him sleep and because he's got to work mm. well you have to work as well yeah your life has changed and your hormones are saying i'm i have 24 7 of this mm. yeah I think that we're sometimes we're afraid it's like that control we're afraid to let somebody else do it or we're so pumped like we got this new title that we have to live up to it so fully you know that we're not ready to hand over some of the responsibilities but I think that you're right like then that kind of isolates the husband or the man or the partner and then you know it's like you and your baby are in this little world and (laughs) you're you're like partners over here like you know, not getting any of the benefits with the baby or you. And some of it is, is hormonally controlled. Mm. Right. <laughs> so uh, this is just the way nature uh, made a female capable of bonding and caring to the offspring. But yes, a conversation has to be had, not in the bedroom, and ideally through pregnancy already, mm. not waiting for childbirth. And of course, that is assuming the relationship has a good communication basis yeah and one more thing i want to add to this before you move on and then when you do get that date night when you do reconnect the woman should not have a pressure to perform sexually for her it's going to be exploratory how will i feel from the inside if intercourse is involved so she should be allowed to go with the flow and stop if and when she finds it necessary Mm. does it feel for women who are pregnant and listening and they are nervous about what to expect their first time after having a baby, should they expect that it is going to be less pleasurable or different or um, their first time being intimate with their partner? Sex is a lot of things. So if we're talking about intercourse, we're going to talk about intercourse. Sex could also be winking at each other across the table, you know? Yeah. So, um, it's, it's a whole thing. But if we talk about intercourse, because it involves the vagina where a baby came out of, or even C-section, it involves the reproductive system. Mechanically, it's kind of the same. But depends now. Did she have an episiotomy? Did she have to heal from sutures and cuts? Uh, is her cervix still tender? Were there any other complications? Um, is everything physically healed as well? No, the vagina does not suddenly become the size of the baby. Everything shrinks back typically unless you're baby number five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, when you'll be a little more expanded. But basically the body recoils. Um, And if your partner tells you, oh, you are so big down there, I can't feel a thing. Well, we have a, and we have had cases like this. Um, that, that, that calls for a little conversation because mm-hmm. whenever we examined those women, nothing was wrong with their vaginas, but, uh, the husband just felt what he felt for whatever reason he felt. And so it went, um, but no, it's for a woman after childbirth to say yes to intercourse. It's not just the head, which is the female the biggest sexual organ for the female. Everything is controlled from the head. Uh, But also is, will it hurt? And I'm nervous about that. Can I tell him to go in slow? Mm -hmm. Can I use lubrication? Should I use lubrication? Should I tell him to stop if it's uncomfortable? Can I tell him to stop if it's uncomfortable? What if we'll change a position? Maybe that will be better for us. 
what if he says, but I want to, and we're just going with it? Well, you know, you have another aspect to discuss in your relationship. It's complex. Mm. That's really good, though, the things that you're bringing up, because I think those, just like you said, if you're having that conversation, then you could say, like, ahead of time, you know, even before a baby is born, like, I know I've, hey, this is what I've heard. And I know that, um, you know, my body's going to be changing. And then after the baby is born, we'll want to, you know, have intercourse. And, but I want to let you know that I might ask you to do these things. I might feel uncomfortable. I won't want you to slow down. That is a really good conversation. I feel work like- with me, right. right? Work with me kind of thing. You're coming into me. In our book, we always, we, we, we wrote this, the vagina is the hostess. The penis is a visitor, as a guest. <laughs> yeah. The vagina has the right to invite, to determine the length of the visit, and to decide when the visit is over. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, women do not exercise this right. Yeah. I don't know why that is, because I'm thinking right now, I'm like, that's a genius conversation, and that would make a lot of, like, that whole situation a lot easier for a lot of couples and um, but women yeah. don't because for millennia if you really look at sexual anthropology for millennia women were at service hmm. and expected to perform and way before women were um, able to sustain themselves economically that was the economics they brought into the equation and it is so deeply ingrained and expected to perform the way the man wants. In other words, if the man says no lubrication, the woman says, oh, he doesn't let me use lubrication. Mm. Well, that's certainly not acceptable. And women need to speak up and say, no, I need to use lubrication. This is something that makes me feel more comfortable. Mm. So anyway, the concept of women being at servitude, that has been changing, especially in the Western world, it has. But... We still encounter women from the Western world who do not claim their rights in the sexual arena. And after childbirth, it becomes more of a part of, a, of, a, of an issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that brought me to another thing, too, is that when I've asked listeners, when I've asked friends, people that I know, when I ask them what libido is, they have no idea. <laughs> they have no idea. Um, or we all assume that it's like this feeling that you all of a sudden get. Um, and that feeling is supposed to tell you that that's when you're ready. That's when your, um, desire is up there and it, it will make intercourse better. And that's what, you know, so is that true? What is libido really? Then let me ask you guys that. We would expand it a little bit from a functional point of view. Libido is really the state of mind. It's more the engine, the, the interest in being sexual, intimate, sexual, intimately sexual. The feeling is already the arousal process. And it's not only for intercourse. The sexual menu should include different things because intercourse is not the end or be all and only thing there is. Mm-hmm. Um, but the libido is the general interest. Uh, and these feeling the sen- the actual body reacting to a sexual interest is actual the sexual arousal process mm-hmm. of it, but they're all used interchanging interchangeably, interchangeably and colloquially. And uh, the idea is, are you into it or are you not? And it's even if you're not into it, give it a chance. Sometimes when they start working on us, quote unquote working on us, uh, we may get into it. Yeah. But if your head is anti, either because you don't want to be there, you cannot shut down all the other things that are running through your head from work to makeup to children to assignment to shopping to whatever, Mm -hmm. then the message will not come from the head to the genitals to get going with arousal, which is the physical process. So nothing will happen. Mm. So you got to shut down the mind in order to open the door to sexual interest, which uh, we as, as women... We have, we should have normally most of the time when uh, the situation presents itself, but not necessarily 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Women sometimes just don't go there. But it doesn't mean to say they cannot engage with a partner and take something else in return for equal satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You owe me one, take the garbage out six times in a row, give me a foot rub, I don't know, whatever. 
<laughs> yeah. But, uh, sure. So bartering is all right as long as it's not the MO of that woman. Because sometimes mm-hmm. as a woman, your body doesn't feel just right. You just don't feel like going there. Your mind has a lot of things on it, and it just does not shut down as easily as the male does. Do you advise women um, in ways that they can be fulfill intimacy for each other without having intercourse? Of course. But penis in vagina is not the only option out there. What if the penis doesn't work, meaning erectile dysfunction? Mm-hmm. What if the vagina is temporarily out of, out of business for a while, for whatever the reason? And besides, what about choices? Some people just do intercourse sometimes, but they do oral manual. They do all the other things too. Mm-hmm. A variety mm-hmm. is fine. Sexuality is about spontaneity and about having fun, doing whatever it is that you like, your choices, your preferences. It should not be a strict cookbook recipe or else it defies its own premise. Yeah. I feel like that's kind of where we get in our heads sometimes. Like that's where we are. It's like it has to be this one way or that's not intercourse or that's not intimacy. And so we just and if we don't want that, then we just shut it down and we're like, move on, you know, like um, we don't consider all the other things that we can do to help connect with each other. Mm Right, then it becomes work. Right, right, and men, many men think it's intercourse or nothing. So you really have to have the discussion about why can't it be other things as well. So again, what we're saying here, it's complex. Mm-hmm. So, so at the risk of perhaps making some people unhappy out there, <laughs> when you counsel people sexually, one cannot go with a cookbook recipe how to solve it. Mm. In other words, it is not you hug her, you kiss, she kisses you, she touches you, you do there, bam, it's going to happen. That only happens in the books or in the movies. And we have books and movies because we don't have it in reality. Mm -hmm. But in reality, when you counsel patients or you help or or people, friends, family, whoever, and you talk about these things, you have to take the situation into the account of their entire matrix of life and relationship and then see what is it that is breaking down or missing to guide them within their own matrix mm-hmm. into their own de- sexual destination. Yep. It is it is a to- the way we look at it over here, it is a total reversal of what is for the most part being practiced out there. Out there it's from the outside in and we would rather look at it from the inside out. Mm-hmm. It is your sexuality. I don't know what turns you on to your partner, nor can I tell you what to do to turn yourself on to your partner. We just have to help you navigate to find your sexual rhythms and interests and preferences and choices and how-tos and what have you and make them work for you. Mm. You cannot give a prescription for sex. It just doesn't happen. And I think that movies play a big part since since you know we were little when we start watching you know fairy Uh tale movies and it shows Mm -hmm. they all happen you know a certain way and it's so magical Mm -hmm. and there's fireworks and so then when we get older and it's not that way we feel like (laughs) we're like what the heck happened and is it me what did i did not do right Mm -hmm. we also just had a, a, a patient in our group who said i just had a baby and I want to know when is sex going to be like in the movies? Mm. Okay. And it was really interesting because some of our ex-patients responded, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at the wrong way to have things, which is exactly what we say. It's not going to be like in the movies. Movies are fantasy. And that's what we all have to explain to ourselves and our partners, that movies are fantasy. Otherwise, they wouldn't be the movies. Yeah. And yeah. they have to make it look glorious and wonderful. That's not reality. Yeah. Let's look at it, if, if we may, from another aspect, and that is to really kind of take a, 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 seat, a step back here and say, oh, really, I didn't think about that. We did not invent sexuality in the 20th century or the 19th century or what have you, okay? The cavemen and cavewoman 100,000 years ago did it too. If they were able to do it, obviously a lot of it is inherent in us. Mm. they did not have the knowledge. And if they would not have known how to do it, we would have been extinct today. So the ability to be sexually connected is inherent in us. The want to be sexually connected is a feeling we should have within us, 
once we have those feelings toward the partner, may it be a partner for the moment or a partner for life, and it is not a prescribed cookbook. Mm. So I had some women who are listeners. Um, they knew that I was going to interview you guys, and they had some questions that they wanted me to ask. Um, one of them was, how do you increase um, libido and how do you and how much is normal per week? How much how much, um, you know, intercourse is normal per week after having a baby? Typical questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> right. Here we we don't hear, yes. You, you probably hear everybody ask you that. You know, uh, because people ask the same questions all the That's time. That's right. There aren't that many questions to ask. That's right. <laughs> really. <laughs> there really aren't. How many times per week? Generally speaking, how many times per week? We're expanding the answer here. Uh, you know, when you're now, when you're in your prime life, I don't know, uh, 20 something to 50 something, and you're in a stable relationship, uh, something about once, twice a week sounds like average. Females in long term relationships, women in long term relationships, and all the excitement is worn out for the most part when we know all, the, all his moves. <laughs> Unless we create an exciting moment, nah. We could forgo it quite a bit. Unlike males in their sexual template, they are extremely arousable and imagination plays a huge role in arousal. Mm-hmm. Females are pragmatic, they're not. So it's not so. So, you know, once or twice a week sounds like an average, mm-hmm. average number. But again, that average can be put on one week, uh, you know, everything is going well. The next week the baby has, or child is sick and we might not do it at all. You know, there's no right or wrong to the once or twice a week. There is fluidity. Yes. It's a state of mind and body connecting in a certain way. Now, after having a baby, as we covered before, we're not going to repeat that. But, you know, once you get the green light to go ahead, as Dr. Rose just said, well, it's fluid. Depends whatever you end up doing. Mm. Yes, when you first meet a new relationship as a female, the excitement is raging and female are much more sexually interested because they thrive on excitement mm-hmm. and nudes. Once the relationship falls into its routine, mundane version, as we said before, women have to work a little harder on shutting down the mind, allowing the time for the us, uh, us time, allow themselves to be aroused sexually and go there. That's where the vacation works very well because it's, it's an excitement. It's a built-in excitement vehicle. Of course, you cannot go on vacation every week unless you're, you're, you're lucky. Right. But, um, uh, but you have to create some newness, some, new, some, some, some uh, new atmosphere, some changes. Do it on the opposite side of the bed. Or whatever it is for the woman that will make her want to engage in this activity, provided that she always appreciates what sexual intimacy does to the relationship it's not a large time consuming event in the weekly number of hours in the relationship but its value is tremendous by way of closeness and intimacy and 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 tolerance of the partner so it 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 has a quite a value some sort of bitcoin in the middle of this market transaction here in in the relationship so um you have to value that as a female and say yes being intimate does bring us together. It does make us tolerate each other better. We're able to overlook and forgive easier. We're able to accept the deficiencies better. Mm-hmm. So we'd like to go there. It's a multi-purpose item here mm-hmm. if the relationship allows for that. So that's a how often. How often depends on your dynamics. But generally speaking, once or twice a week is the general average. And now, if somebody now, now, if we may throw in, if somebody says, "Well, my husband wants it every day," and we've had too many cases mm-hmm. to count about this, my husband wants it every day, that falls into the problematic arena, mm-hmm. and that needs professional addressing. Mm-hmm. That is not normal for the male nor for the female to accommodate him every day. Mm-hmm. That puts pressure on the woman, and she will really shut down. She'll just become a server, a sexual servant. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned that um, there's a newness and we kind of thrive off of that at the beginning of the relationship. But then um, but the, the fact that it'll fade, because I feel like a lot of women question that part of when they're married and, 
especially if it's long term, you know, right. three years in, then when there's not that so and so called flame, you know, like they f they feel like, oh, well, this is this isn't working out or, you know, like we used to be this way and now the, f you know, the flame has gone out. And so but I feel like um, from what you're saying, that's that's like normal. <laughs> that's something to be it expected. Is very normal. Normal. It is normal. <laughs> And a woman should recognize that, should know that. Hopefully your podcast will reach many women and hopefully those women will share it with other women. Mm -hmm. It is very normal, but it also calls for particular measures as a female. Remember again, if you go again into anthropology, we were not destined to live beyond our, our high 20s to lower 30s. It's only in the last so many hundreds of years that longevity has extended. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, the mechanism is built for early marriage, as used to be, children, most women died at childbirth, tremendous attrition, maybe there was another man in the picture, or maybe you had a good marriage, you did not die at childbirth, poof. and then when you are somewhere around the 30 or whatever, you die. You don't have the time to fall into the other restrictions. But today, we live forever and a day, thank God. And as one 80-year-old patient who called us and said, she has to come in, we ask her, what is the problem? She said, husband takes Viagra, I got to keep up with him. <laughs> you know, I mean, today, true, I mean, true, mm -hmm. true story. So now women live for a long, 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 long time. And you have to go through the cycles of life and as they affect sexuality as well. And it becomes a complex issue again. It's just a complex <laughs> thing that, all the complex. way around. When we set out to write our book, um, can we mention it here? Yes, yes. Our book, Parting the Curtains, which is a, a woman's handbook of sex and sexuality, and we can talk later where it's available from Amazon anywhere else. When we set out to write this, actually, it was a combination of discussions like this, as we have with you today, with our patients, through our blog, and then turning it into a handbook. Mm. All these questions that all the women ask all the time, over and over again. It is so common. And we do have a chapter on pregnancy and after after delivery and all of that. Yeah, all, this, all this, all, all this answers answers a there. lot of the questions. <laughs> but, and it's a handbook because as women, we wanted women to see that they're normal when they experience those things. We want them to understand them. We wanted them to then develop the means to navigate those issues in their lives. So there will be happy women. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a huge, a huge reason why I wanted to have you guys on. Um, like I mentioned earlier, before we started recording, recording is that, you know, these conversations, these topics, like most of us at some point are going to ask all these same questions to ourselves, but we're going to be too scared to tell our friends. We're going to be too scared to tell our partners, or we're going to feel like there's something wrong with us. And, and then we're just not, and then we're not going to know what, what to do. And, um, you know, like you had mentioned, gynecology only goes so far to where then, you know, when they turn you away, that makes you mm -hmm. feel even more like there's something wrong with me. And so, um, it's worked. yeah. And so that I think that, creating a book like that and especially having conversations like this um is going to be super powerful for women because then they're going to see like hey i'm not the only one um i don't have to be ashamed that i'm going through this and um i'm not the only one whose body especially with social media and movie stars you know you see them like their body bounces back because they have professionals that are helping them look good you know or um photoshopping them in pictures and so you know there's this comparison that's always going on and um so i'm really excited that you guys um have created party in the curtains because we definitely need For that reason you we are not even going to count how many patients arrived over here either on their own or being dragged in by a male partner and when we ask what's the problem the answer is i am not performing like in the movies yes so common. It is so sad. And if, if and if the woman only needs education, then it turns into a happy session. But if the male sits there and says, no, this is what I want. I want like in the movies. And she said, I don't want to lose him. We found ourselves in a very complex session. Mm -hmm. And so many women still feel that um, being at servitude is the only thing they can bring to the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's very sad. So yes, education, 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 and changing parameters and perceptions. Mm -hmm. 
Cause through I, every possible mean. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I think that's a good thing. Cause you know, um, especially if your parents didn't have any knowledge or have conversations, if you don't have an open relationship, when you grew up, then you got the standard, um, you know, health talk from in a junior high or high school that tells you nothing about your body. <laughs> like basically, um, and then, and then, so basically all of our knowledge about our bodies is from our friends, which probably they got their knowledge from their older sister or somebody, you know, a friend that was in their neighborhood that knew absolutely nothing about what they were talking about. And then that's what we grew up thinking that it's supposed to be like. And so um, just like anything else, we have to educate ourselves. Um, just yes, there are a lot of myths. There are a lot of myths that need to be dispelled. Yes. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. From the finest and the nicest homes. That's but right. there are myths. And that's before we go into cultural differences mm -hmm. and religious differences that we mentioned earlier. They even put another layer of complexity on the issue. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you can put a bunch of women on an island, you know, from all races and cultures and religions, a bunch of women over there. They'll all have the same thing because at the end of the day, and at the, at the days of the cave woman, it was just the body and her relationship with her body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're Let's it, remember yeah. that. That's right. There is an inherent biological sense of who we are and what we are and what we want to do. And then there come all the other layers on top of it by way of the media and society and culture and religion and and I'm not knocking them down. I'm just saying they're on restrictive codes or, or ambiguities or misconceptions that mess it all up, pardon the French. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then the other question that I had for you guys, which I know that you get probably all the time, is how do you increase your libido? Is there a way to increase it? By listening this whole come to this whole podcast, you should know <laughs> what to do in essence, which is basically recognize that libido is your state of mind. Mm. Do I really want to engage with that person? Whatever he or she, whatever the person is, do I want to engage with that person? If not, why not? And if I don't know why not and how to solve it, then I better reach for professional help. If I do want to engage it, then as a female, I got to shut down my brain from all the other tasks of life mm -hmm. and just go and engage in the nice of bodies meeting each other and taking me on whatever journey I want to go on. Mm. And it's not about the final stop. It's about the journey. Mm. And I'm so glad you reiterated that because I feel like that is one of the myth things is that the libido is something that, you know, it's when you lock eyes with your partner and fireworks happen and then, you know, you're, you just connect. But, um, it's actually, like you said, it's a, it's a mind thing that we actually have to, um, do like we have to think about it and we have to do, you know, like take that, um, initiative. We it just isn't like, we're not just going to stand there and all of a sudden you're going to be like, Oh, my libido is awesome. <laughs> like, no. you know, or, <laughs> and I think that that's what we expect. We expect to just like for it to just turn on one day without any effort. Um, because we, we're not, we didn't know. We don't know. We just see what we see in the movies. And we tell people. Yeah. It happens. It happens when you're very young, mm -hmm. right? At 18, 16, 15, right. 21, whatever, when life is beginning and your hormones are going and all of this. Yes. If you are not inhibited for whatever the reasons, there could be different reasons why, but if you're not inhibited, yes, your libido will be ready, willing, and able, mm -hmm. but later on in life, it becomes complex. Yeah. That's why very often a woman needs to just say, even if I don't feel it, let me try and see if I can get into it. And sometimes just that brings it brings it back for the moment in terms of allowing you to be intimate. Mm -hmm. You sort of say, well, I'm going to try and see where I can take it, like we said before. And age is not an issue here. Although this podcast uh, is really geared to the young, mm -hmm. uh, amazingly enough, you could be in your 60s, 70s and in a new relationship, because as we said before, we're living longer and the partner could have died or divorced or whatever the story is. And you're in a new relationship. And lo and behold, we meet those women who are busy as bunny rabbits mm -hmm. at those ages and everything feels fine and it's wonderful. 
And then a year later, they contact us again and say, you know, the spark is gone. What's mm -hmm. going on? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, welcome to reality. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that takes a lot of pressure off ourselves, too, to acknowledge that, you know, like you, you had said, um, let me see if I can try. Let me see if I can get there instead of saying no. That's right. Right. Don't, 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 don't say no unless you have a good reason to say no. Say, okay, let's see. Let's give it a shot. Yes, yes. No, no. And let's see how far. Mm -hmm. That's right. That'll, it, will, it will also teach you how to just go with the flow, which is what sexuality is all about. Mm -hmm. Of course, don't forget to do practice safe sex and all that stuff. But to go with the flow, and, that's, and, and then you'll be, you, you may surprise yourself. You may get there. Mm -hmm. And you'll say, wow, I didn't think I was going to. You see, it's built in if you open the door to it. Mm. My last question for you guys um, is women who have, I know we've been talking a lot about, you know, just right outside of childbirth, but women who have had several children, they're worried that things have changed down there. They're worried that with age, you know, um, it'll be different or it gets becomes less. And so I had a, mo uh, a mom ask, is there anything that she can do besides Kegels um, to take care of herself, to to stay healthy, to keep it um, tighter, or you know all of the, all the fears that she has about her vagina as she's getting older? Is there things that she should be doing to take care of that? The short answer: not much. We cannot tighten our vagina. Mm. It is a structure as it is. The Kegel exercises are a wonderful thing for uh, stability in the area. They do not enhance any tightening of the vagina. If your vagina is loose from multiple childbirths, your vagina is going to be a little looser from that. There is no way to tighten it unless you're going for a surgical repair, which most gynecologists will frown upon because they would not want to jeopardize your health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not much to do. The body is built to be the way it is. Uh, the beauty is, in the, is between the ears, not uh, where the vagina is. Mm -hmm. You are born with your body parts the way they are. So do your Kegels for general health down there. Uh, make sure that you practice proper genital hygiene. You can search this uh, uh, this uh, phrase genital hygiene on our website and you can come to our blog or on Google and our blog will come about that. Um, make Keep yourself healthy in the sense of uh, have your uh, regular gyno checkups, uh, practice safe sex. Remember that your sexual organ after the head the physical sexual organ is the clitoris that is north of the vagina, mm -hmm. not in the vagina. Perhaps it's a whole podcast by itself, yeah. but it's north of the vagina, and that uh, does not affect the, mm -hmm. how the vagina looks. And that's what that is. And also that the male penis is not going to be the same when they age either. Mm. True, mm. they do not go through childbirth, but they also age. Their erections are not as solid hard. They may take a lo longer time to attain erection. They're not exactly staying the same. Aging is aging. Mm -hmm. But body is built to go through the cycles of life and uh, just keep a healthy lifestyle down there. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice and very very freeing and I felt like you also did a little myth busting in there too that like because uh, everything tells us do this or that and you'll have a tighter vagina or you know like um, <laughs> but and, and that puts pressure on us like oh my gosh we have to be doing these things um, but I think just um, enjoying and respecting our bodies and and how it ages and changes is a beautiful thing and not I mean something that you should be able to do together with your partner um, mm -hmm. yeah exactly. Ideally. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The vagina is not a muscle that you can pump your biceps and have a gorgeous biceps. <laughs> That's not what the vagina is. The yeah. vagina is a, is, 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 a, is a structure of tissue that is there and it's expendable and it's living and it's dynamic and it's changing and, and it, 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 it does not have, the, you cannot bulk it up by doing exercise. You could have the strongest, the strongest uh, pelvic floor muscles by doing 2 million kegels a day. Yeah. But that's not going to make your vagina tighter. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And for women listening who are um, feeling maybe discouraged in that answer, because I feel like if you've been searching for so long and you expect you want to find the answer and it's not what you expected. But I I feel like that um, I guarantee or at least from my experience that it it's not going to matter how your vagina changes as long as the intimacy is there. You're connecting with your partner and they get more satisfaction when you are getting satisfaction um, despite what it looks like or what you think it looks like. Um, and so I feel like it's more of a the connection. Like they don't they don't care. And you gave them beautiful children and they just want to be connected with you. And that I think is the main thing. Yes, that is correct. It's what's between the ears. Mm. And if the guy is mm. not going to like who you are, He's not going to like who you are, whether your vagina is pretty or not. And we've seen those women who went through gen- ve- through vaginal rejuvenation surgeries and still did not see themselves any prettier than before. Mm-hmm. So it's not about the actual looks. And uh, it is about the relationship indeed. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, the penis gets in and does its thing, then the penis is happy. And the penis does not have eyes, so it really doesn't see what's going on in there. <laughs> yeah. It's going in. And it's a sense, though. Look, right. I mean, if you... If you just had your first child and you were a little snugger before than after having your first child, you're just a little more elastic, not hanging wide open, but a little more elastic there. Uh, But if the guy feels a slight difference, so tell him, okay, so it is what it is. You remember, a whole baby came out of there. So let's have fun with that. So as you said, it's it's really um, about the the relationship. It's not the body parts. It's not the body parts. If it's a good relationship, it won't matter. Not at all. So how can everybody find you guys, contact you if they're if they've been listening and they say like, oh, I you know, I am one of those women who needs to talk to somebody. I want to check out the blog um, to search these things. How can everybody find you, contact you um, and all that stuff? Our website is women in plural womentc.com w-o-m-e-n-t-c.com we have a youtube channel women's therapy center Uh, i'm sure your blog will have it in writing as well Mm -hmm. Uh, you can google our names Uh, we're very findable and the book is available on amazon already am i right it's available on amazon digital and hard print uh the holidays have passed but often people Buy it as a as a uh, stocking stuffer mm-hmm. for women, or bridal parties, bridal showers, mm-hmm. or or baby showers because it answers a lot of questions. But yeah, parting the curtains, the book is available on Amazon and other, and actually on all e formats as ebook formats as well. Mm-hmm. As information is on our website with direct links as well. Well, I just want to acknowledge you guys real quick before we get off and just that I am very grateful, especially hearing from Marnie's story. And I've watched your guys' YouTube videos, several of them. And um, I'm very passionate about the idea that, you know, women shouldn't feel isolated in their struggles. And I've and from what I've seen and from the testimonials that um, have been shared from your guys' office, you're just putting these topics on the map that people don't normally talk about and women are feeling empowered. Their relationships are reconnecting. They don't feel like they're broken. Um, and I feel like that's a huge thing. And so, um, man, that's like really empowering to see, um, as somebody who like myself is trying to, um, empower women and do things that not everybody else is doing. I feel like that's exactly what you guys have done, um, is, you know, seen a need and, talked about topics that were taboo or that you know aren't normally talked about and changed a lot of lives in the process and I think that's very awesome and very admirable so I was really excited to have you guys on thank you so much we appreciate the opportunity as well it's about not artificializing nor medicalizing sexuality it's just what the body wants to do so we really appreciate you having us on and we we welcome any inquiries anybody who needs help Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Dita and Dr. Ross. I really appreciate them coming on and sharing their knowledge and information on 
some of what we would think to be the most embarrassing topics, but I really truly feel like um, normalizing these conversations is really healthy for us. If you want to find out more about them, if you want to contact them, find their book, read their blog, you can go to ittakesavillage.com and there I will have all the links in one place for you to find them. And since this episode has gone a little longer than normal, I thought, eh, why not let's share a inspirational quote that I found that I really felt like was appropriate for this conversation and just talking about our bodies. And it says, you are not too fat or too skinny. You're not too old or too wrinkly. Your nose isn't too big and your boobs aren't too small. You're not ugly or stupid. This body of yours, no matter what shape or size, has carried you around your whole life. It's taken you places, enabled you to explore the world, picked you up when you've fallen down, fought through colds and flu, broken bones and broken hearts. Even though you put it down, it keeps going, keeps on working to the best it can. Through the good and the bad, your heart has kept beating. It will take you through the very end. What a wonderful, clever thing it is. What a brilliant, beautiful person you are. As always, you can follow the Spotify playlist for the It Takes a Village podcast, and you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at the Ash Carol. Also, make sure you check out our iTunes page and leave a rating or review if you feel led to do so. That would really help me out, and I would really, really appreciate it. 